Hi, my name is Callie Chappelle, and thanks for joining me with this video, Introduction to Counterplans, Part 4, Intro to Conditionality. This video is part of my novice debate series, Go Fight Win, teaching novice debaters how to do policy debate. So my name is Callie Chappelle, and I'm a debater for the University of Michigan. I debated for Traverse City Central High School in high school, and I am a second negative first affirmative speaker. I think conditionality good is a true argument. That's my fun fact for this video. All right, so how do you make the most out of these videos? Well, you should take notes and you should rewatch bits that you need to re-explain. Um, there's a lot of information that's new and especially the counterplans lectures. So I totally understand if you're just like, say what? And then like need to go back and rewatch. Hopefully we'll have worksheets and or supplemental materials that go along with the video. So check out the video description for those. Next, you don't need to memorize it all, but at least be familiar with everything in the video. It's a building process. And finally, your coach may like things differently or you may like to debate in a different style. This is totally okay. This is just one starting point and not an end point. So what is conditionality? Well, there are three ways you can quote unquote run a counterplan. This is a binding agreement in cross-examination and people can read theory against any way you choose to run the counterplan. So here are the three ways, and then we'll talk about how it's deployed in the debate round. First is unconditional. So when you say you're running the counterplan unconditionally, it means that you, the negative, can never kick out of a counterplan in any speech, or the counterplan in any speech. The next way to run it is dispositionally, and that means that you, the negative, can kick out of the counterplan unless they straight turn the net benefit. So straight turning meaning either they read an impact turn or a link turn to the net benefit DA, or, uh, or yeah, a link turn including the like link goes the other way and no uniqueness. But we'll talk about this later. And finally, you can say that you're reading the counterplan conditionally, which means that you can kick out of the counterplan in any one of the negative speeches, that being the block or the 2NR. Okay, so how do you know what, how they're reading the counterplan, right? Like what the, as we say, the status of the counterplan is. Well, when the, who is cross-exing the 1NC? Who cross-exes that speech? Yeah, when the 1A cross-exes the 1NC, the first words out of your mouth, if they read a counterplan or a K, is what is the status of the advocacy or the advocacies? Essentially what you're asking them is, is a counterplan or K conditional, dispositional, or unconditional? So what do you say again? What is the status of the advocacies? Okay, and they're gonna tell you. They're gonna be like, it's conditional, it's dispositional, or it's unconditional, okay? And then you're on your merry way and you can just pull your block and put that into the 2AC. So what is conditionality as an argument, right? So it's an AF theory argument that says that if the negative reads a counterplan or K, or multiple counterplans or Ks, that it's theoretically illegitimate and means that the neg should lose, okay? If they if the neg reads a counterplan or K and multiple counterplans and Ks and kick out of them at any time, that's the stipulation here, that that is theoretically illegitimate and means the neg should lose. So why is that? Why is that theor theoretically illegitimate? Well, that's the AF standards debate, right? So that's the, those are the reasons that you read in your theory blocker in the 2AC about why conditionality is bad. And we'll, we'll sh talk about what those reasons are. So how do you know what way they're running the counterplan? Well, like I said, you should always ask which way they're reading the counterplan. If they read a counterplan or a K in the cross X of the 1NC, remember, by the 1A, you're right. So AF says, the 1A says, what is the status of the counterplan or K? Or what is the status of the advocacies? And no matter what they say, whether they say it's conditional, it's dispositional, unconditional, or they say it's Batman, always say, what does that mean? Not everyone, so why would you ask that? So not everyone actually defines these the same way. And sometimes they might say it's one thing when they really mean it's another thing. So maybe in crosses with the one and C, they'll try to be sneaky and they'll be like, oh, it's dispositional. And then they kick out of it in the 2NC, and you're just like, uh, across to the 2NC, you're just like, you told me the counterplan was dispositional. I thought that we didn't, like, we straight turned it, like, why are you kicking out of it? And they're like, oh, because dispositional means you can kick out of it at any time. And then you're just like, oh, crap, why, why? <laughs> why did this happen to me? So always, do not put yourself in that pinch, always ask what it means, whether regardless of what they say. And neg, if you're neg and you want to say that your advocacy is conditional, you should say the following phrase. The status quo is always an option. Okay? So the status quo is always an option. Why do you want to do this? If you're a more advanced debater, it allows you to do judge kick. So there's this thing in the 2NR where you can um, have the judge choose at the end of the debate whether or not they want to evaluate the world with or without the counter plan, and which is called judge kick because the judge kicks the counter plan for you if they choose if they think that the status quo is better. Um, and and answering in this way 
allows you to have that option. Now, a novice is that probably went way over your head. Don't worry about it. Well, the biggest thing that you should get out of it is you should practice saying the status quo is always an option because when you learn about later techniques such as judge kick, then you've already kind of trained yourself to say that. All right, so what would I ever want to read an argument dispositionally? So yeah, there are a couple of times that you might want to read it dispositionally. In general, I encourage everyone to read um, their advocacies conditionally if they're reading more than one and if they predict that they might not go for it in the 2NR, especially since the condo debate is like a pretty good debate and it's like a pretty easy debate to be had. So, but there are a couple times when you might want to read an argument dispositionally. So you'd read it if you know that 100% there is no chance the AF could straight turn the mechanism of the counter plan or the counter plan net benefit. So an example of an argument that I read dispositionally would be the NEPA counterplan. Because the NEPA counterplan has uh, the AF be implemented, it's a process counterplan that has the AF implemented in a way that does not negatively affect minority communities. So it prevents the, uh, essentially the paving over of economically disadvantaged groups. Obviously, especially minority groups. So obviously no one is going to straight turn this counterplan because they're not going to go straight up go for discrimination against minorities is good. No one's gonna say that in a debate round. So it's like pretty safe to read an argument dispositionally, that argument dispositionally, because it's unlikely that they're gonna make you go for it. And also, so essentially it's just conditional, right? So remind, let's think about what a straight turn is again, okay? It's when the AF only reads offense against a position, forcing the negative to go for it because it's become a position for the AF. So for dis, for disad, straight turning is where you only read a link turn, or you only read an impact turn, but not both. So I just thought I'd throw that in there just as a reminder. If you really are like, I totally don't remember what this is, definitely check out the lecture about disads and especially the AF answers to disads. And that's where we talk about straight turning. All right, would I ever want to read an argument unconditionally? Well, the only time that I would read an argument unconditionally is if you're only reading one off case position, so one off case counterpoint or K, and you are 100% sure you're going to go for it in the 2NR. For example, if the 1 and C is only the anthropocentrism critique, you can say it's unconditional. Or if the 1 and C is only the Wilderson critique, you can just be like, it's unconditional. We're not going to kick it. All right. So condo counterplans sound a little bit like they're cheating. So you, the Ned can read as many counterplans as they want, and they can kick out of it at any time. That seems like the two, uh, the, the, like that model is going to make the 2 AC impossible. Well, it turns out the condo counterplans probably are a little bit cheating. Right? And... It turns out that you can actually read arguments about you, the AF, can read arguments about why they're cheating and why condo shouldn't be, like conditional advocacy shouldn't be read in debate. This is called a theory argument. So this is kind of beyond understanding theory is like a whole new lecture that I'm not going to delve into here. But what you need to understand is how to read and answer conditionality before your first tournament. So if you, if I, for some reason, don't have enough time to make a conditionality lecture, you will definitely need to talk to your varsity or your coaches about what conditionality is and how to answer it. I'm going to give you a brief overview, just kind of like the quick and dirty about what you absolutely need to know about condo. So first, you need to know your judge. So you should look at your judge's philosophy on, um, before before the debate starts. Some of them like condo, some of them don't. Some of them like two condo, some of them like one counter plan, one K. Everybody's kind of different about what their threshold is, is um, as far as how cheating the night can be. If you can't find them on the wiki, then you should ask the judge before the round uh, and they can tell you what their preferences are. All right, so here are examples of some condo blocks. Don't worry about what all this means. You're gonna look at this block and be like, I have no idea, like 95% of what's on this. That's totally okay. What I want you to be is at least familiar with what a condo block looks like, and then also be familiar about where you can find one. So if you hear conditionality and you're not entirely sure, at least you can read your block and you can respond to some of the arguments. But I'm gonna make a more detailed video about how to debate condo coming in the future. All right. So when you first introduce condo, well, you introduce it in the 2AC. Why is that? Because you find out whether the counterplay and the K are conditional in the cross X of the 1NC. And what speech comes after the 1NC? The 2AC. So what does the 2AC say? Well, the 2AC says conditionality is bad, right? Why do they say that? Because condition what is conditionality again? Conditionality is the negative having uh, the ability to kick out of their counterplay or K at any time in the debate. And that is cheating. That the AF is saying that's cheating, and that would be bad for the AF. So it's it's a good reason why the AF would say the conditionality is bad. All right, so here are three reasons. Time and strategy, contradictions, advocacy skills, and and finally is uh, the interpretation. 
all right except for just ignore this okay just ignore this i don't know why that's still in here um so just like any other theory argument for example topicality the uh the theory block has both an interpretation for what the debate should look like and then uh reasons or standards why that interpretation is good in this case it's time strategy contradictions and advocacy skills you can have a lot of different um interpretations for conditionality so for this one it's conditionality is a reason to reject the team so if they have any kind of condo then they should lose the neg should lose this interpretation here at the bottom is different uh this is the neg it's infinite dispositional options so it allows um so that means that they can read as many countable in cases as they want but they all have to be dispo um, so you can choose what interpretation you like, you pick the interpretation based on the round, one that I've heard is one counter plan 1k, etc. Um, but you should only read one interpretation, unlike this block, which I don't know why it has two, and you should pick which one is best suited for the round and which is best suited for what you plan to defend. And here is a 2 and c condo block. So the negative says condo is good. Yeah, because like we said they were condo, so we should defend their, that that's good. So you have a counter interpretation. So we get x counter plans in xk, so you insert whatever you did. So let's say the 1 and c was 2 counter plans in 1k. You'd say counter interpretation, we get 2 counter plans in 1k. And then you have these standards, key to neg flex, promote strategic thinking, education, time strats, key, add-ons, check, multiple terms worth, reciprocity. And then, just like topicality, when you're answering that on the affirmative, the negative makes a reasonability claim. There's uh, that we ran a reasonable number of conditional advocacy, so you shouldn't vote us down, right? All right. So here are the big ideas about debating condo. That was a lot of information, and if you go back and read through those blocks, not all those words are going to make sense to you right now. That's okay. But here are the big things about how to ex debate condo, especially when you're a novice. First, make sure to extend your offense, which are the points on your block. So going back to this one, the offense is neg flex, strategic thinking, and education, okay? Also, make sure to answer each point of your opponent's block. You often have to use your own blocks and standards to do this. So think about impacting condo, like real world impacts from impacting T. So let's say that you're neg and you're answering this condo block. So you need to answer time and strats queue, contradictions, and advocacy skills, as well as their interpretation, okay? So that's what I mean by you need to answer each point in your opponent's block. So it's just like you're doing line by line. Obviously, you can't drop an argument. You have to answer all of those using your line by line skills. And the biggest thing is just don't drop anything. So sometimes it's hard when people are going a million miles an hour to flow everything from the theory block. It's totally okay if in cross X you're like, what was the third argument on condo? I didn't get that. Because you absolutely need to write that down and you absolutely need to respond to it because you cannot drop theory arguments. It's a surefire way for the other team to win. So I hope this was helpful about debating condo. That's just a quick introduction, and we'll have more videos about how to debate condo more specifically, but at least you should have a good idea about what condo is, and then basically how to answer it in a debate. So I hope to see you in later videos, and I hope this was educational.